So um, I'm going to try to give two separate uh, talks tonight. We'll have a little time for questions in between uh, each of those. So first of all, with regard to um, detection, so colonoscopy, I hope that you understand, is has proven to be a very, very highly operator dependent procedure. You know, we talk, for example, about CT is less operator dependent than um, ultrasound. Colonoscopy is much more operator dependent than uh, ultrasound and really any area that you look at, um, there is operator dependence. And we're going to focus particularly on detection, which is really the first area where operator dependence was demonstrated in a major way. So to do colonoscopy from a detection standpoint, well, one of the things that you have to bring to the procedure is, is a real understanding of the spectrum of subtlety that's present in uh, precancerous lesions. And we have two, of course, major classes of precancerous lesions, the conventional adenomas and the serrated lesions. And both of them uh, can be extremely subtle, particularly the, um, the serrated lesions. So we have seen variation um, demonstrated in the detection of both classes of lesions, as well as prevention of interval cancer. And I think in general, the variation is greater for serrated lesions. And people think that that serrated lesions are missed more than conventional adenomas. Both of them are missed uh, plenty. If you look at what we call interval cancers, people get cancer after a colonoscopy, before their next scheduled colonoscopy. Based on molecular features, these cancers appear to have gone through the serrated pathway disproportionately. But if you look at the risk of cancer in individual serrated lesions compared to conventional adenomas of similar size, it's about a seventh that of uh, conventional adenomas. So individual serrated lesions are less dangerous than adenomas. The reason they uh, contribute disproportionately to interval cancers is that they're more likely to be missed. So this is a slide with some pictures of serrated lesions. And as you go across the top from left to right, and then the bottom from left to right, you can see serrated lesions of, of progressively more subtle nature. And the bottom in the middle is a lesion that looks to be completely flat. And the bottom in the right is an SSL. The best, the best term for these lesions now is sessile serrated lesions, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Sessile serrated lesions, sessile serrated adenoma, sessile serrated polyp, all of those terms are virtually completely 1000% synonymous. So SSLs uh, can either not have cytological dysplasia, that's what uh, the first five are, are without cytological dysplasia. This one has cytological dysplasia and it has a little area in it that looks like a conventional adenoma, both endoscopically and histologically. The actual borders of the lesion are out where the yellow arrows, arrows are. And one thing that experts are a little bit concerned about is that sometimes people see the dysplastic portion of an SSL, but not the entire perimeter of the, of the lesion. So on the left, is a, a very flat conventional um, adenoma, and on the right, uh, a very flat serrated lesion. And <clears throat> to detect these, you have to come at the procedure with a sense that you're going to look for very subtle changes in the color, the texture uh, of the mucosa, disruption of the vascular pattern, the shape. Um, so you can see this one uh, this is an adenoma on the left better after injection, and on the right, this is a very flat serrated lesion. Most This is probably Paris class 2B that is truly flat. Most of the truly flat lesions that I've seen in the colon um, are, are serrated lesions. So that's the, that's the first thing about um, detection. And hopefully you're either doing enough colonoscopy to have seen a lot of this kind of thing, or you'll look at enough pictures that you have uh, a sense of this, of this spectrum of precancerous appearance of lesions. So we measure um, how well people are doing with detection with this thing called the adenoma detection rate, which has been around now for more than 20 years. And we know that it predicts the risk of interval cancer. And there's evidence that if you go out to about 50% adenoma detection rate, um, you can get the interval cancer rate down to close to zero, but you continue to get gains in interval cancer protection out to ADRs that are that high. So we have these recommendations for what could be considered minimum acceptable um, <clears throat> ADRs. So for primary screening, we're using colonoscopy for screening. 
that minimum acceptable in a mixed gender patient population would be 25%. But because we get these gains in cancer prevention out to 50%, we can also say that there's an optimal or aspirational threshold of around 50%. Below 25%, we think people should actually do remedial work. The only real indication for colonoscopy or I guess set of patients where um, we would use a separate set of thresholds is in the fit positive uh, population. And there are some uh, practices like the Kaiser practice in the US where there are big organized screening programs that use fit as their primary screening. And most of the colonoscopy that's done is in this population. And there you need a higher minimum acceptable threshold and optimal or aspirational threshold. So the ADR does not include serrated lesions. Sessile serrated lesions are not included um, in the measurement. And it's been hard to create a national detection target for serrated lesions. It's quite reasonable to have one in your institution. The problem with doing it nationally is that SSL detection is a function not only of endoscopist performance, but pathologist uh, training bias and other factors that really aren't completely understood. But if you look at, at what pathologists do well in colon polyps, I would say that there are two things. One is they do a great job of putting lesions either into the conventional adenoma class or the serrated class. So those, those two distinctions are, are pretty clear. And I think for the most part, they're good at saying when cancer is present, cancer being defined as submucosal invasion. After that, everything is subject to a lot of inner observer variation. And within the serrated class, the problem is differentiating hyperplastic polyps from SSLs. A lot of inner observer variation uh, with that. And I think it's hard to have a measure that you think is uh, testing what the pathologist is doing rather than the endoscopist. Presuming that the pathologists within your institution use the same criteria or similar uh, criteria have the same tendencies, then you can probably do it in your um, institution. I would say in general, a good SSL target is somewhere around seven uh, to nine uh, percent as a, as a minimum threshold. <clears throat> now, um, <clears throat> we talked about withdrawal time. And many years ago, we came up with this rule that the uh, minimum average withdrawal time in normal colonoscopies should be six minutes. But we've seen a couple of studies showing, uh, first of all, that interval cancer detection actually levels out at about nine minutes. And then from the New Hampshire registry, a study that showed that detection of serrated lesions leveled out at about nine minutes. So probably the amount of time that it takes to inspect the colon carefully is more like eight to nine minutes than it is like um, six minutes. So how do we get to very high level detection? Well, first of all, as a colonoscopist, you have to come to the procedure with this sense of what flat disease looks like. And then um, you can get these very high levels with just basics. So first of all, good equipment, you have to use um, a high definition scope and white light is adequate. And then you combine that with meticulous um, technique. You do have to have split or same day preparations. The patient should take half or all the preparation on the day of the procedure. And then of course, if you don't measure ADR, you're not gonna know whether you're really good, but several studies have shown that just the process of measuring and reporting to endoscopists, their ADR will generally cause them uh, to improve. Okay, so these are the basics uh, then, looking behind all the folds, cleaning up and um, distending adequately. And we now say that in general, we think that we should examine uh, the right colon twice. So you, you start at the appendiceal orifice, come back to the uh, hepatic flexure, and then go back down to the cecum and repeat it. And the reason this is um, recommended is because we know colonoscopy is not as effective generally at preventing right-sided cancer as it is at preventing left-sided cancer. That's the rationale for looking at it twice. I think the basics are in, not in any way rocket science. They involve, first of all, you can see there's an excellent prep. Secondly, we've got to look behind all the folds, and that's what takes time. It's this time-consuming process of sticking your nose between each and every set of uh, haustral folds in order to inspect them, clean everything up, and make sure that the colon gets adequately um, distended. You can see there's, a, there's an endocuff vision, which is on the end of the 
scope here and I'll come back to special uh, devices and so on. But I really wanna emphasize here that again, you can get very high levels of detection without any uh, particular device. As I said, once you get to the paddock flexure, you go back down to the cecum, you look at the cecum in the forward view again, and then you can either repeat the examination in the forward view or go in to retroflexion. We have two randomized control trials that show it's just as good to look again in the forward view as it is um, in retroflexion. This is examination of the left colon. And if you're in the left lateral decubitus position, and especially if you're using uh, propofol, um, <clears throat> because the patient often has a very lax anal sphincter, they're passing gas uh, uh, easily. The challenge is often achieving adequate distension. And you do that, I think, partly by using CO2. If you're using CO2, you really don't worry, you don't care whether about uh, how much gas you put in because you don't have to worry about distension and abdominal discover discomfort in the recovery area because that's gonna go away very quickly uh, with CO2. Or you can fill the left colon with uh, water um, or what we do often is we literally take the patient's rear end and squeeze it uh, together. The technician does this. We call that cracoid uh, pressure. That's my one joke for tonight. Um, so uh, that just keeps the gas from mechanically escaping um, from the colon. And, uh, but the idea is you've got, you can also rotate the patient, but if they're either heavy or um, if you're using deep sedation, you may not want to do that because it seems like there's a slightly greater aspiration risk reflux and so on when you rotate the patient onto their back. So you can see a very active examination, moving in and out, working the folds. So you see on the proximal uh, sides of the folds, these are the fundamentals of high level detection. Then I think there's, there's a lot of discussion in the GI literature about whether or not we should do something else, either a, uh, a different technique or a device on the scope, something special to improve detection. So there are two goals of these kinds of devices. One is exposing more mucosa and the other one is highlighting. And I'm, I'm gonna focus on the finger devices uh, because they've been associated, I think, across the literature with the most consistent gains in um, ADR. And then for highlighting flat lesions, things are moving towards artificial intelligence. And the problem with both of these uh, for a lot of people in practice, especially ASC or office practice is the cost um, associated with them. So this is the endocuff uh, vision. The original endocuff or the new one have had multiple randomized control trials. The average gain in detection uh, is about 7% in ADR. We have this rule from uh, a study in the New England Journal, Doug Corley from Kaiser, uh, seven years ago now, that for each 1% gain in the ADR, there's a 3% reduction in the risk of interval cancer and a 5% uh, reduction in the risk of fatal cancer. So a 7% increase in detection is a clinically important one. And what these fingers do is they allow you to see better on the proximal sides of folds. And we've shown in a randomized trial that you can actually come out of the colon two minutes faster with one of these uh, devices on and still have an improvement in detection. And that's just because this work of looking on the proximal sides of folds uh, goes faster with a device like that. With regard to highlighting, um, you may have heard uh, the, the chromoendoscopy is not effective. And most of that is based on older uh, studies. The last version, Xera 2 or the Olympus 180 system, had a very dark uh, NBI mode that you really had to get close to the mucosa to see well. The 190, the Xera 3 system, the illumination is quite bright. And um, actually for both adenomas and serrated lesions, the color contrast between the lesion and the normal mucosa is greater uh, with um, electronic, with NBI. So I think that uh, they actually, there's, there's clear evidence actually that they do work. This is a patient level data uh, meta-analysis from gastroenterology published last year showing that NBI, especially if you're using the 190 system and if you have an excellent uh, preparation that there are clear increases in NBI. One caveat about these is you really have to have an excellent prep to use them because if there is either retained stool or mucus, um, it's, it's very uncomfortable uh, to use them in, in NBI or in the Fuji BLI. This stuff looks red or pink. It seems more 
opaque. But if you have a really excellent preparation, I actually think you can see more and uh, go faster. So I mostly use white light, but also I do sometimes use um, NBI. If you have the Fuji scopes, both the Fuji um, BLI, which looks very much like MBI, and LCI, linked color imaging, which has a reddish color to it, both of them have been shown to produce gains um, in detection in multiple studies. I finally just want to point out that, you know, I said colonoscopy is operator dependent. I think the benefits of these devices are very operator dependent also. And many times when you look at studies, you can't appreciate it because you just get an overall result. So we've been trying for the last several years in our detection studies to publish the, the, the results of the individual uh, participating endoscopists. So I'll just give you a sense of this. This is a study with endorings, which is a device that's not available anymore, but it, it had a concept that was very similar to um, endocuff. And you look at the overall result, it looks quite positive. This is for uh, adenomas per uh, colonoscopy. But if you look at the individual uh, doctor results, you can see that the positive result is largely from one physician who had a very positive result. Many of the other doctors had no real perceptible uh, improvement. So it can be very useful if you get the opportunity to try these out yourself and even to measure whether or not they impact your own detection. Uh, that can be important. So we're moving into the era of AI, the first AI programs to become available uh, for colonoscopy are CAD detection devices, so-called CAD-E devices. The first one to get FDA approval is the Medtronic GI uh, Genius. And that is not what I'm showing you right now, but they, they, the programs look basically the same. They put a box uh, around lesions and, um, and highlight them for you. And I think that these are, these are useful. I've, I've been using and testing the GI uh, genius, and they're not perfect, but they're very good as an adjunct. And if you look at the first randomized controlled trials, uh, four from China, one from Italy and the US, the, the average gain in adenoma detection rate has been 11%. So that is actually the, the single biggest jump we've seen in ADR from any uh, device that we have um, that we that's been tested uh, thus far. So you know I think it's important in conclusion to to use these concepts of minimum acceptable as well as aspirational targets. If you want, you can measure SL SSL detection in your institution or sort of use seven to nine percent as a as a gauge for where you want to be. But you just have to realize that you could be very low primarily because of your pathologist. You have to understand subtlety got to do all the basics well. Um, if there's a suboptimal ADR, the first thing you want to look at is withdrawal time because it will reflect suboptimal technique, but you don't want to use withdrawal time as a, as a corrective measure. You have to focus on technique. If people focus on applying the technique adequately, then the withdrawal time will follow because it takes a certain amount of time to do good technique well. For mucosal exposure, endocuff vision, there's a variant of it called Amplify, which, which uh, has been shown in a non-inferiority study to be equal to endocuff vision. It's a finger device also. And then AI looks like the future of highlighting. The main problem with it so far is that the cost of it is very uh, significant. And so um, people are in some cases sort of looking at to, when the competitors come out and see if that's going to force uh, prices down. So Kuna, um, I'm going to I'm going to stop there, and I will um, I'll switch the slide decks if I could. But we could we could take perhaps a a few minutes and um, see if people have questions before I go on to the other other slide deck. Sure. So there's one question in the chat box from Ben Goff. It says, in one of your images, it looks like you're using an endocuff. Do you recommend using these routinely? So I like to use um, endocuffs in um, uh, pretty much all screening, surveillance, and diagnostic examinations. I don't use them in inflammatory bowel disease. The endocuff does um, sort of decrease the ability to get into the TI as well as the ability to get deeply into the TI. So if you're making a Crohn's assessment, if you know that there are um, strictures, if you know the patient has severe sigmoid diverticular disease, then I wouldn't do it. But for routine 
uh, screening, surveillance, diagnostic exams, I, I like to use them. I don't use them for therapeutic exams. If I'm going in to remove big polyps, then I, I use a cap on the scope, the Olympus or the Steris US endoscopy, um, di so-called distal uh, attachment. And that also has been used as a detection device, but, but I use it um, for uh, endoscopic mucosal resection. It's a similar kind of cap to what's used for, for ESD. And um, yeah, so, so good question. I think that the, the bugaboo is that the cost of those devices is about $25. And so docs who are in ASCs or office practice, they just don't want that to come out of their uh, facility fee. And, um, but if you, if you like it and you're in a hospital-based practice, I would, I would give some consideration to, to trying it out. And if you can measure whether it improves your performance, that's, that's great too. I think you answered the second question in the chat box of how much it would cost. Um, another question that I had um, is you said that high definition can increase your ADR from 25% to 50% or in positive fit patients to upwards of 70%. So is this something we should be doing more routinely? Should it be more of the standard of care um, or does it not really translate to the clinical significance for detecting cancers? No, it does. I mean, like, as I said, for every 1% gain in the ADR, the calculations are that you get a 3% reduction in the rate of interval cancer and a 5% reduction in the rate of fatal interval cancer. And this, these associations of ADR and interval cancer rates have been shown now in multiple studies. So um, Kuna, I just want to correct that. I, I didn't actually say that high definition uh, increases the ADR what I, what I, it, do, it does increase the ADR, ADR, but in meta-analyses, it does it by about two to 3%. What I was saying is that people can get to ADRs of 50% in primary screening by just doing the basics. And the basics include a high definition scope, not a standard definition scope. Um, and almost nobody, you know, buys standard definition scopes anymore, which is, which is a good thing. So the, the basics are the high definition scope, split or same day preps, and then just doing meticulous white light colonoscopy. That's, I mean, I have an ADR of, uh, of 50% and that's all I do uh, routinely, although I've added you know, the endocuff vision, but you can get to 50% with those things alone. And so I'm, I'm just trying to, to emphasize that the basics are, are the most important thing, if that makes sense. Yes, thank you so much for clarifying. So I think that's it for questions for this section, if you'd like to move, move it yeah. forward. Okay, so am I still sharing my screen? No. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Okay, so I'm just gonna make a few comments about um, interval about uh, malpractice risk in colonoscopy, which is kind of a sort of a different um, topic than detection. But the first risk I'm gonna talk about is interval cancer. I will tell you what I get uh, consent for in my own practice is uh, missing. So I, I, I tell patients that this is the best test there is for detection, but it's not perfect. Very rarely it can miss something important. That's, that's the actual language that I use. And then I say that there's, a risk of, of bleeding if we remove polyps, primarily if we remove a large lesion. And third, I say that there's a risk of perforation, which in my, in my experience is, is one in many, many thousands. So that's, that's what I say. I make my fellows also get consent for splenic injury. I don't, I don't get it myself, but I make my fellows get consent for it. Um, so let's talk about some of these things and, and, and where the malpractices uh, risk is. So first of all, interval cancer. So in, it, in an interval cancer, an expert, um, they, the plaintiff's experts always say the same thing, that you weren't careful enough. And the defense experts always say that there's a lot of evidence that colonoscopy is not perfect, um, even when it's performed uh, carefully. So that's the basic gist of it. Some people have said that it's inevitable that you're going to have an interval cancer if you do a lot of colonoscopy. You can sort of predict um, an interval cancer by how good your ADR is and how much colonoscopy you do. But even if you have a very high ADR, you're probably eventually uh, gonna have one. These cases 
kind of always break down along the same lines. First of all, uh, people look at the tumor and then historical features, procedure, the experts, the doctor's performance. So if the tumor looks like it could have arisen very quickly, then it's better from a defense standpoint. So if it's got microsatellite instability, poor differentiation, signet ring cell cancers, it's about 1% one, 1 of colon cancers are signet ring cells, tumors, and everybody agrees they, they, they have a poor prognosis and they probably grow really quickly. And then the shape, it's better if it's flat. If it's bulky when it's diagnosed, it's hard to say that it wasn't flat, but if it's flat when it's diagnosed, it's, it gets pretty easy to say, well, it was, it was probably even flatter at the time that the colonoscopy uh, was done. The historical features can be important. The amount of time, <clears throat> I think the, the longest interval that I've seen between when a colonoscopy was done and when, when a cancer was diagnosed and it led to a malpractice case is about uh, four years. Most of the cases uh, seem, to, seem to go around two to three years, I would say, uh, previous colonoscopy. If, there's, if there are a set of symptoms like rectal bleeding or iron deficiency anemia that date all the way back to when the colonoscopy was performed, that's not good because it suggests that you know, if there's a cancer there, it's been bleeding this whole time. Well, there was cancer probably there at the time that the original procedure was performed. Everybody's going to look at the procedure, um, the withdrawal time. Our, our guidelines say that, that um, these withdrawal times should not be considered in, um, in medical legal cases, but they are. They always are. And I, I have to tell you that, that I've, I've testified uh, mostly for the defense, but I've taken a few uh, plaintiff's cases. And I, I took one where uh, there was, you know, an investigation of a specific abnormality on a CT scan, and the entire procedure from start to finish was four minutes. And you could argue that, well, you know, you probably should have spent eight to 10 minutes just looking at the segment of the colon where the CT abnormality was. So there are times when, when you just get these suggestions of, of overt rushing uh, during the procedure. That's going to be sort of uncovered by looking at the details of the examination. Uh, the documentation of the landmarks, the bowel prep, um, polypectomy technique can be uh, important. Did retroflexion occur? Some of these cases are, are in the rectum. And was it documented? I would say whenever you, whenever you um, uh, are photographing, um, if you go into retroflexion, you should take a photograph of it. You want to have photographs of the appendiceal orifice and the ileocecal valve, and you want them to be clean. You don't just want to enter into the cecum. There's still pools of greenish fluid, and you start taking photographs that you're going to put on the chart because somebody is going to say, well, that's, that's how you examine the colon. Get, get things cleaned up and get them ready for examination and then take your um, photographs. Um, the experts are important. You want the expert on the other side. This is always true to say something that's easy to, to prove uh, is wrong. And the doctor's in, uh, uh, performance in deposition is, is important. Do they understand ADR? Have they measured it? Were they measuring it at the time that the interval cancer occurred or were they, have they started measuring it since then? I've seen people reconstruct ADRs from uh, billing records. I've seen plaintiff's attorneys do this, get, get somebody's um, uh, you know, billing records, and you can tell from them how many times a polyp was removed from the uh, polypectomy, the snaring codes and the biopsy codes. And if, you know, if the um, biopsy and snaring codes are a very small percentage of all the colonoscopy, it makes it look like the ADR uh, was, was very small. So better to measure all all of those things. So all those come into play. My own sense with regard to interval cancers are that if you are, are um, cleaning up the colon well, taking photographs well, naming the landmarks, taking an adequate period of time, that it's very hard for a plaintiff to win um, an interval cancer case. And if you combine that with you know, being able to demonstrate that you've got a high ADR, it becomes almost impossible because juries in general understand uh, very well that medical procedures are not uh, perfect. And so usually these cases are only lost where there's some egregious uh, behavior. I'm gonna mention just a few things. I think perforation cases are very hard for plaintiffs to win on the basis of the fact that the perforation occurred. They, they can be won at times um, if, they're, if they're not managed well or if pain after the procedure 
is not managed well. So we've got these three types of perforations, diagnostic rupture perforations. Uh, the old rule that you should never push the colonoscope against fixed resistance, I think is, is very reliable for preventing um, this type of perforation that occurs from the side of the scope. Therapeutic uh, perfs from, from polypectomy. Um, I, I haven't had a delayed perf for more than 10 years. And it's because, you know, we just stain the submucosa for every EMR now. So if there's been a muscle injury, just invariably you see it during the procedure and you can close it with uh, clips. So that's become less of, of uh, a problem with regard to EMR. Barotrauma perfs, these are the kind of the worst perfs. They're also fairly rare. People who get barotrauma perfs invariably have a sigmoid colon that's involved with severe diverticular disease. And what happens is that as you're going through that tight angulated sigmoid and pumping gas in, that sometimes if there's a competent ileocecal valve, gas will get trapped between the scope tip and the gas can't escape back through this narrowed sigmoid and get out the anus and the ileocecal valve and you get this closed system and you get distension and then uh, rupture. And these patients do the worst of any kind of perforation. They tend to get septic very quickly. As you know, they can get abdominal compartment syndromes. So you have to be willing and ready to, to um, needle decompress them. I've only ever had one of these in my career, and it was a fellow insertion using CO2. So CO2 will prevent delayed barotrauma, um, but it won't prevent immediate uh, barotrauma because it's a gas and you can distend the colon with it. Splenic injury, if it results in splenectomy, can be um, a source of malpractice risk. And the main recognized risk factor for this is female uh, gender. And about 75% of the cases occur in women. And, you know, we don't have a clear rule for preventing it. My own rule is that if you have the scope tip up proximal to the splenic flexure, you need to be very careful with withdrawal of the um, instrument in terms of the amount of torque and how hard you pull. There's some twisting of that splenocolic ligament that causes the spleen to bend enough, you get a crack in the capsule. And if it happens to be over a vessel, it doesn't have to be a big crack to start bleeding. And if it results in an intrasplenic hematoma, you know, you can eventually get rupture of the capsule uh, from a bleed that starts off as fairly small. There's been one study that suggested in the U.S. this occurs in about one in every um, 6,000 colonoscopies, I, I, some kind of splenic injury that's, that's clinically uh, significant. Perforation risk is only one in a few thousand. I will say my own unit over the last uh, 25 years, I think we've had more splenic injuries, mostly with fellow insertions, than we have uh, perforations uh, of the colon. So uh, we need a better rule for how to prevent it. Bleeding tends to not have much risk. I would just say with regard to PrEP that um, you want to use a validated scale. The best one is the Boston uh, Bowel Prep um, scale uh, for clinical practice because you're, you're describing the PrEP at that point where you're ready to examine. And most of these uh, other scales are really best for clinical uh, trials. The Aronchik um, scale, good and fair, actually collapsed to exactly the same um, measurement. But, you know, when a medical legal action, if, if you use the word fair, it sort of implies that you didn't see everything and poor says you clearly didn't. So you should have repeated the exam at an earlier, um, at an earlier interval. And, you know, with the Boston scale, we say that if it's less than two in any segment, it's inadequate and should be repeated. And we now have a guideline that says that if you uh, either abort an exam or you say that the prep, what well, you did the exam, but you say that the prep was inadequate, you should repeat it within a year. You shouldn't, shouldn't sort of guess, you know, like maybe I found a couple of small polyps. I would normally do the next exam in five years or seven years, but I'm just going to hedge to two or three years. Our guidelines say, if you say the prep wasn't, wasn't adequate, you should come back in um, less than a year. Uh, photography, I sort of uh, mentioned, have the photographs um, you know, represent the, the, um, the best uh, quality, the way that you're actually going to do the examination. Aspirin, there's no need uh, to stop it ever really. 
in my own practice, we stop it if it's just being prescribed for hypertension as a risk factor. If it's prescribed for coronary disease, um, stroke risk, TIA, we don't uh, stop it. And then um, for large EMRs, again, if it's hypertension only, I'll stop it afterwards, sometimes for a, a week or two. The non-aspirin antiplatelet agents, anticoagulants, follow the guidelines. I just say in general, with regard to everything, follow the guidelines. You don't want to get caught um, with a, the medical legal risk associated with thromboembolism. We, we generally say it's better for patients to bleed than it is for them um, to have a stroke. So follow the guidelines with regard to these. Then I, I was just going to finally say something about uh, tattooing because I think it's, it's relevant to what um, you guys uh, do. We'll talk a little bit about the, the technique of it. And um, if you're using spot EX, you know, usually now volumes of about 0.75 to 1 ml per site. When you're tattooing for surgery, I like to tattoo just at the distal end of tumors. And you may have seen this recent stuff about there, there are some really clear, clearly documented cases of seeding the colon from biopsy of colon cancer. So what happens is that you, you go up, maybe you see a cancer in the cecum and you take uh, biopsies and then you come back and you remove some polyps while you're clearing the colon. And then late, later, the patient presents with a cancer at the site of a polypectomy. And the molecular features of that cancer are virtually identical to the original cancer. And the only way that can really happen is with seeding. So we say that the last, very last thing um, when there's cancer present that should take place during the colonoscopy is to biopsy it. And you even want to tattoo it before uh, you biopsy it. Once you get um, cancer cells in the channel of the scope, you can't get rid of them by washing or um, any other, any other uh, step. Um, in general, you know, the only, the only really secure from a colonoscopy standpoint locations um, are probably the rectum and the distal sigmoid. You can be sure where you are. And then if you, you're either in the cecum or you can still see the cecum, uh, endoscopically. Otherwise, I tell people during colonoscopy, don't specify the segment that you're in. If, you, if you're not sure if you're in the transverse or the descending colon, or you think you're in the transverse, don't say that um, when you're talking about a cancer, something that's going to go to surgery, because you don't want the surgeon, if they get in there and they can't find the tattoo, you don't want them to rely on what you described. What, what, I, what I tell people is you have the, you and the surgeon have to have a mutual understanding that they have to find the uh, tattoo. Um, if you can't find the tattoo intraoperatively, either scope the patient yourself to find it or get, a, um, get the endoscopist to come to the OR and find the tattoo for you. And then it's really important for endoscopists to note that it, whether there are multiple tattoos. We, I see sort of see a couple of ranges with tattoos. One is where they're not used at all. And the other one is you'll see patients that have three or four sets of, of tattoos um, in their colon. And if a colonoscopist sees that, if you're, if you're working with, with uh, a gastroenterologist, you know, try to encourage them that if they're going to tattoo something in the, in the uh, distal sigmoid, and there was already a tattoo in the proximal sigmoid, you know, that you want to know about that because you don't want to go in there and remove the bowel in the first tattoo that uh, you find. So um, the language and the communication is really important. I think it's a joint effort between the endoscopist and the surgeon to make sure that the right segment uh, gets, um, gets removed. Because this, this does basically get, can lead to lawsuits that are sort of like wrong site surgery uh, cases. From a, uh, a, an injection uh, method, you can do this directly. The key thing is to use a sort of a PPD approach where you get into the uh, through the mucosa, and then you have to lift the needle toward the center of the lumen and actually see the shape of the bevel in the submucosa. And then you know you're ready to inject. Inject a small amount, make sure it's in the submucosa. I've seen actually colorectal surgeons before in depositions who didn't understand that the tattoo is supposed to be placed originally in the submucosa. That's where the tattoo uh, belongs, and you can then see it, of course, then uh, from the from the peritoneal cavity, from the from cirrhosal 
um, surface. So if you're tattooing for follow-up, we just put in one tattoo and we always say where the location is. So if I, in this case, what I say is with the lesion down, the tattoo is immediately distal and that's for um, endoscopic follow-up. The other way to make sure you get it in the submucosa is the bleb method where you first make a um, injection with saline and notice you pull back on the needle and lift the needle toward the lumen. So you see that the shape of the needle through the mucosa and then put uh, a little bit of um, saline in there. And now you've got an easy target for putting the tattoo in. Now you'll, you're gonna see during surgery, you've probably seen it already, people spilling tattoo into the peritoneal uh, cavity. And it's really important that you, um, that you don't get fooled by that. And I, I have multiple times seen surgeons do that. They can't find the tattoo in the wall of the colon. So they look around and they see some tattoo sitting loose on the, um, on the cirrhosal surface. And they think, well, that, that must have been placed in the location where the lesion is. And that's just really not true. Um, because this stuff, if you shoot it in the peritoneal cavity, it can go all over the place. So you've got to find the tattoo from the uh, peritoneal surface. You have, to, you have to find it actually in the wall of the colon. Uh, I, tell, I tell people if they are tattooing a really obese, especially a male, because they, they tend to have a lot more fat on the cirrhosal surface, you know, to put some extra in, really shoot for a circumferential um, it, uh, injection. So anyway, I won't belabor that by showing this. Uh, other issues in malpractice, don't dilate asymptomatic strictures in general just to get to the other side. I say that, I do that occasionally. I'll dilate something to get a scope through, but I usually only dilate enough to get a thin scope through an ultra thin or a pediatric scope. Uh, don't treat radiation proctopathy that's asymptomatic. Um, occasionally it can cause complications, discomfort, uh, bleeding, especially patients that are on coagulopathy. So make sure it's clinically necessary. Don't treat asymptomatic angiodysplasia. If you see angiodysplasias in routine colonoscopy, unless they're bleeding, the patient's anemic or having bleed, uh, leave them alone. And then in general, don't use hot forceps for polypectomy. They're not effective and they're not necessary. They're, they're only appropriate for polypectomy of lesions that are five millimeters or smaller. All those lesions should be removed without electrocautery. Cold snaring is the best. Hot forceps or cold forceps can be used for avulsion, which is a step uh, that we do in endoscopic mucosal resection if we can't um, get the snare on tissue. But for removing small polyps, uh, you know, it just looks like you're out of date if you're using uh, hot forceps. I've seen a couple of lawsuits now of people being operated for benign colon polyps that in retrospect were endoscopically resected. And then they have a leak and, uh, and get into a lot of trouble. And both the surgeon and the endoscopist get sued for ever having done the resection to begin with. So we have a lot of resections still in the US for benign colon polyps and um, the morbidity and mortality of surgical resection as well as the cost are considerably greater than endoscopic resection. So, um, you know, our colorectal surgeons, I hope you do this too, when they get, when they get referrals like this, they generally send them to me and uh, we, we look at the photographs and in many cases, we go ahead and proceed with endoscopic uh, resection and then have a systematic method of following up your pathology and laboratory studies. Make sure you get instructions uh, for follow-up to your patients that need it. Okay, see, I'm gonna stop there uh, again, um, Kuna, I'll stop sharing here. And I, I covered a lot there, but just to give you a sense of some of the uh, issues that come up and see if you guys have uh, some comments for me. Sure, of course, thank you so much. Um, I think we covered a lot of ground there. I'll give people a few minutes to ask some questions, but just to get the ball rolling. So you mentioned that you at times dilate strictures. About how much are you balloon dilating these strictures at a time? So I, you know, that's it's a it's a great uh, question because you see a lot of strictures um, in the colon that are quite tight and are completely asymptomatic. Um, so I think that the in general the the biggest that you need to dilate is 15 millimeters. Um, and I think that's true in the small bowel uh, also. Um, uh, for anastomotic strictures, um, if they have a tendency to, to 
come back down, to scar back down quickly, I think you can go bigger. Uh, the, for Crohn's related strictures, the length of the stricture is a risk factor for perforation. So for many of those strictures, I would definitely confine yourself to about 15 millimeters um, or so. For anastomotic strictures also, as you know, you can, you can cut them uh, if they are resistant to dilation. Great, thank you. Um, another question for you is you mentioned essentially doing hot forceps for smaller polyps, like about three to four millimeters is a no-no. How about for the larger ones with snares? Do you prefer cold or hot? So um, yeah, so right now for, for serrated lesions, we've got a lot of literature that says that you can remove them effectively with cold resection. So cold resection is, um, I think right now the the way to go for serrated lesions, regardless of their size. You can inject them or not inject them. Uh, it's just a paper a couple of weeks ago, a multinational paper, about 600 SSLs that were 10 millimeters or larger. And they had a recurrence rate of 8%, which is identical to the largest series of cold EMR. So EMR, of course, just means inject and then snare resect. And so, um, for large adenomas, much more controversial. It's clear that when you remove large adenomas by cold resection, you have a higher recurrence rate. And um, what you're doing is you're trading off the, the, the fact that the risk of a complication is basically negligible with cold resection versus a higher, um, a higher recurrence rate. So I... Um, I think we can sort of personalize it. We've got two big randomized controlled trials going on comparing hot versus cold EMR. And I will say that um, I don't know how it's going to come down, uh, but um, I don't want to say too much more about that. I, I think there's some lesions that you just can't remove by, by cold EMR. If they're bulky, um, if you have non-granular lesions with pseudo-depression, Anything that you think has a high risk of cancer, I wouldn't remove uh, without electrocautery. And other than that, it's, it's a kind of a whole uh, separate lecture. With regard, if the question was specifically about hot forceps, what I was referring to is the process of avulsion. So during, during EMR, as you know, if you're snaring, you're snaring in pieces, you often run into an area that's very flat or it's fibrotic and you can't get a hold of it with the snare. So you have to have some other method. And what used to be done was ablation. People would take out an argon plasma coagulator probe and burn that little flat area up that they couldn't snare. And now we think that that's a no-no. Don't do that because that's associated with a higher recurrence rate. Basically, the reason the recurrence rate is higher with ablation of visible polyp. So I'm talking about ablation of visible polyp that the reason is, is because you're just using your judgment about how much to burn it. You have no way of knowing if you've gotten deep enough to actually destroy all of that flat polyp tissue. So we think it's better to avulse it, which means to grab it with forceps. And you can do that either cold, people just grab a hold of it with cold forceps and pull it off. And you're trying to get it come off in that same submucosal resection plane. Um, or you can do it with hot forceps. And uh, I actually like to do it with hot forceps, so we do it, we do what, call, that's called hot avulsion. And we just do it with cutting current, endo cut eye, cutting current on the 141 setting. Just grab a little bit over the edge of that um, uh, flat polyp tissue, tent it mechanically, and then just tap the yellow pedal on uh, cutting current, and it'll peel off in the same uh, layer. And it, when you're done, it looks like you snared it off. The submucosal defect looks the same as, as the snaring defect does. And that's not associated with a higher recurrence rate. So I think that's the only role right now for hot forceps if that was the question. Now, you, people get confused anymore because we have these studies that show that if you've done an EMR and you've got the entire lesion out either by snaring or avulsion, and then we talk about ablation of the normal perimeter with a snare tip using soft coag current. And that dramatically reduces the recurrence rate. So what, what goes on with recurrences, recurrences come in from the perimeter of the EMR defect, not from the base. They come in from the perimeter. 
And you can almost eradicate recurrences. Uh, you can get the recurrence rate, even for big lesions, down to below 2% using hot EMR, snare, evulse if you can't get a hold of it, and then burn up the perimeter because they're going to be, even, even if it looks perfect, there are going to be some cells that will survive. And the bigger the lesion, the greater the risk. So hot EMR is much more effective for reducing recurrences, but you've got some risk of uh, complications, delayed bleeds and, and so on. And you know we clip close now um, EMR defects that are 20 millimeters or larger, proximal to the splenic flexure, um, removed with hot EMR. If you do cold EMR, you don't have to clip close anything. So anyway, that's, that's, a, lot, that's a lot to cover without pictures to, to show it. So sorry about that. That's okay. That was a great response. Thank you for that. Um, another question for you is you mentioned it's better to tattoo first and then biopsy second because there's no way to clear those cancer cells from the channel. What if you have multiple biopsy sites, then does it make a difference? So, you know, so I guess what you do is, um, let's say you, you're going to go in uh, to the, you, you're doing a colonoscopy and you get to the cecum and there's cancer in the cecum. You just look at it. And now you go ahead and you clear the colon without touching the cancer. You do all the polypectomies that you know that you need to do. I, you know, if you're going to do a right hemicolectomy, you don't need to um, remove the polyps in the right colon. But you know, you come you come back to the transverse colon. You do all the polypectomies out to the to the rectum, and now you just drive back up to the cecum. You and I mean, that's not a good example because nothing in the cecum needs to be tattooed. Uh, so. But let's say the lesions, you know, it's around the hepatic flexure. Now you put your tattoos in, and then as the very last step, you biopsy the uh, the cancer. And the idea is now you don't have it. You you we think you're going to eliminate the risk of contaminating one of your uh, polypectomy sites. We don't actually know if that works, but we think it works. And I, I will say that the risk looks like it's only about. Uh, uh, of actually, if you do them in the wrong order, the risk of contaminating one of the sites is only about 1%. But I think that even that 1%, we, we would want to avoid that. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Rex. It looks like that's all we have for questions. Okay. Well, listen, thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate your uh, interest in <laughs> education on Sunday night. Very impressive. And I, I wish you all good luck. Thank you. Have a good night. Thanks. Bye-bye.